Great. Okay, let's get started. First, I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. My name is Yang Yang Zhou. I'm an assistant professor in political science here at UBC, and I'm a faculty member of the UBC Center for Migration Studies. Um, to keep up to date with all our events, news, and opportunities, please follow us on Twitter at UBC Migration. I'm very pleased to introduce our speaker today, a friend of mine, Dr. Nikar Gaikwad. Dr. Gaikwad is an assistant professor of political science at Columbia University. His work is driven by questions about how identity politics and economic contestation intersect to shape political strategies, attitudes, and behaviors. In his book project entitled Identity Politics and Economic Policy, which won the APSA Juan Linz Prize for Best Dissertation, Dr. Gaikwad examines how politicians in diverse societies will often choose to play the identity guard to boost support among their in-group while also giving economic concessions to minority outgroups in order to win elections. To learn more about this really fascinating project, you can visit his website, nikargaikwad.com, and you can listen to the fourth episode of Scope Conditions podcast that I co-host with Alan Jacobs here at UBC. And you can find our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Um, Dr. Nick, uh, Dr. Gaikwad also researches migration issues with two recent AJPS articles on internal migration within India. Today, he is presenting a new project, The Politics of South-South Migration, it's co-authored work with Colby Hansen from the US Naval War College and Elise Toth from Stanford University. During the talk, if you have any pressing clarification questions, please type them in the chat box to me and I will read them aloud. After the talk, we'll close the slides and we'll move on to the Q&A. Okay, and with that, uh, the floor is yours, Nikar. Good afternoon and thank you all for coming. Uh, a special thanks to you, Yang Yang, for your really generous introduction and to the Center for Migration Studies for giving me this terrific opportunity to share my research. Uh, I would also take this opportunity to uh, make a plug for scope conditions, not just the episode that Yang Yang mentioned uh, along with Alan, but all of the other episodes uh, that have been produced so far have been really terrific, and I encourage you all to. Uh, to, to listen to that podcast. Um, so thank you once again uh, for coming and, and, and uh, listening to my research. The title of my presentation today is The Politics of South-South Migration. Uh, as Yang Yang mentioned, this is joint research with Elise Toth of Stanford and uh, Colby Hansen of the US uh, Naval War College. I'd like to motivate the, the broader project uh, and research agenda by pointing out that there has been a significant recent shift in global migration flows that has uh, yet to be, uh, that is undocumented in scholarly research. So conventional uh, uh, global migra migratory flows have looked at migration from developing countries to developed countries in the global north. So on the left-hand panel, we see some quintessential photos of uh, migrants coming into uh, North America from, from Central America. Uh, we see, uh, we know of a, a great amount of research looking at migration from North Africa and from the Middle East into Europe. Uh, the traditional main destinations for cross-border migration have indeed been countries such as the United States, Germany, France, UK, Canada, Australia, et cetera. In recent decades, though, we have seen a significant uptick in new forms of migration and cross-border migration between countries in the global south. So on the right-hand panel, I have a couple of photos looking at the migration of doctors and nurses from India to the UAE, that's the upper panel. And below, we see a lot of mi migration from uh, other countries in Asia to places such as Singapore. The main destinations of these new South-South migratory flows are countries in the Persian Gulf, such as Saudi Arabia, UAE, Jordan, Bahrain, Qatar, but also other countries such as Russia, Pakistan, Singapore, Thailand. So scholars across the, the social sciences have been very interested in studying how cross-border migration impacts 
uh, both migrants and their sending regions. What I'm going to argue today is that these new forms of migration, South-South migration, are quite distinctive and have distinctive characteristics as compared to South-North migration, which then complicate our scholarly understanding of the impacts of migration. Whereas conventional forms of migration, the sort of uh, the sort uh, South-North uh, uh, sort of uh, axis looks at a large number of family-based migratory flows. You see asylum seekers being a pretty big component of migrants to northern industrialized economies. Labor migration to Western democracies tends to be highly restricted, highly regulated, and the migrants who do tend to, to enter Western democracies tend to be high-skilled. Um, we also see that destinations in the South-North axis tend to be democracies. Uh, these democracies tend to be quite liberal and they offer migrants a route and path to citizenship. Uh, th th as a result of which migration to Western democracies tends to be permanent. As a result, scholarly research that has looked at South-North migration has looked at ways in which the political effects of migration are best felt in destination countries. Uh, we look at, there's a lot of work looking at how natives respond to migrants, how migrants end up integrating into democratic nations and changing their attitudes and behaviors. The channels over here are political, social, and economic. Now, by contrast, the South-South migratory flows that, uh, that are going to be the focus of our attention today are almost exclusively labor-based in character and not family-based or asylum-based. Now, these labor-based flows tend to also be encouraged by policy regimes in destination, regi in destination countries that are very conducive to in-migration. These kinds of uh, policy regimes attract uh, uh, labor migrants of varying skill levels, from construction workers to mid-skill employees, like those working in uh, hotels and, and, and food, uh, uh, the food industry, as well as very high-skill labor, such as executives, financiers, uh, et cetera, investors. Now, because South, uh, South migration tends to be, uh, uh, the destination regions in these, in these flows tend to be non-democratic countries or quasi-democratic countries, these, uh, these regions offer few routes to citizenship for migrants. As a result of which, these migratory flows tend to be temporary and migrants tend to go back to their uh, home countries following uh, temporary stints abroad. As a result of which the political consequences of these kinds of migratory flows, we argue, will be felt most acutely in sending regions as opposed to destination regions. And as because these migratory flows are so economic in, in character and focus, we also think that the channel by which uh, migration will have an impact on migrants in their sending communities will be economic in character. Okay. So the focus on, that, on, on the talk today and on this research is gonna be let, trying to understand how migration from developing countries to other countries in the global South can have political consequences through this economic channel of economic empowerment. I would also make a, take a moment right now to point out that migration uh, in the global South uh, tends, to be, uh, is, tends to be distinct from migration to advanced industrialized economies in that migrants uh, are uh, disproportionately uh, tend to belong to disadvantaged minority groups. We see this when you look at, say, migration from Kerala, one of the biggest states in India, sending uh, migrants to the Persian Gulf, uh, where you see Christians and Muslims, uh, minorities in the Indian context, being disproportionately the kinds of migrants who are leaving the country. Uh, we see this across uh, different contexts as well. And we think one of the reasons why we see so much uh, international labor-based migration for minorities is that in developing countries and ethnically divided societies, disadvantaged minorities face structural barriers to economic advancement within the domestic economies. We find that employers tend to routinely discriminate against uh, members of disadvantaged minority groups in terms of giving access to jobs, in terms of promotions and upward mobility. They tend to privilege skills associated with members belonging to the majority or advanced ethnic groups. And these employers tend to hire within ethnic or clan networks, which again favor members of the majority group. So these employment opportunities that exist within the domestic economy, uh, so in terms of migration to other parts of the same country, 
tend not to be uh, uh, that open to members of disadvantaged groups. By contrast, international labor mobility uh, provides a pathway, an avenue by which disadvantaged minorities can get access to new kinds of jobs. And this is because employers in other regions of the world that are not beholden to the same kinds of uh, ranked ethnic stratifications in domestic economies lack an incentive to perpetuate ethnicity-based discrimination. So we see evidence of this when it comes to gender-based uh, discrimination with respect to international trade. In a similar, uh, uh, similar vein, we think that minorities are more likely and more open to migrating abroad because they don't face the kinds of uh, barriers to upward mobility that they face within the domestic economy. Going back to the Indian context, for instance, minorities who, for instance, don't speak the language of the majority group, say Hindi, uh, might not be advantaged within the domestic economy, but by virtue of, say, speaking English, uh, uh, they end up having skills that are valued by employers abroad. So we think, again, that Inter the international environment, the global economy provides new avenues for mobility and economic advancement for minorities and uh, international cross-border migration provides an avenue through which this takes place. Okay, so, uh, so that, that sort of brings us to the core uh, sets of questions that we're, we are exploring in this research agenda. We're looking to see how does labor migration impact migrants and communities? Now, of course, this question has been of long-standing interest to uh, social scientists across the disciplines. Scholars have looked at ways in which migration has economic impacts. Migration is predicted to increase the economic well-being of migrants and their families to remittances. Uh, there's evidence showing that uh, migrants tend to have more economic optimism. They tend to consume more goods. Uh, and migrants become less reliant on state-provided goods as they become more economically uh, well-off. But there's also evidence and theor theoretical reasons to believe that migrants might fare worse economically if these opportunities in destination regions are not very uh, uh, promising, if they remain restricted. There's also a lot of work looking at the political consequences of migration. So we know that migrants, when they move to new lands, get exposed to new forms of governments. So specifically in the South-North dimension, you tend to see migrants moving from non-democratic or auto autocratic countries to liberal democracies, where they're getting to interact with, uh, with uh, democratic norms, institutions. And you might expect that migrants then become drivers of uh, uh, adopting these democratic norms and transmitting them back to their home countries. At the same time, there's also research showing that migrants tend to retreat from the state, they remain, remain politically ignored and marginalized, and tend to not, they find it difficult to integrate into their destination regions. So once again, the, the evidence is a bit, bit mixed when you think about the political consequences of migration. Finally, we, we think about ways in which migration can change uh, migrants' social identities, as well as notions of uh, belonging. So in a way, migration will expose individuals to new cultures, new peoples, religions, ethnicities, et cetera. This is predicted to increase cultural tolerance. Uh, migrants that end up interacting with members of different groups uh, might bring back what scholars call social remittances and norms of inter-ethnic tolerance, which they might transmit back to their home communities. At the same time, there's also evidence showing that migrants uh, may remain socially ghettoized and isolated in destination regions. I sort of bring in all this evidence to show uh, that, um, or to bring home the point that when you think, well, the work up to now that has looked at South-North migration has looked at a very particular kind of migratory flows. And when looking at the impact of those flows on these economic, political, and social changes have come up with a particular set of theories and, 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 and um, empirical sets of findings. We're gonna sort of argue today that when you look at different types of migration flows, in particular migration in the South-South context, where a lot of migrants are moving from say more democratic to less democratic countries, what kind of ways and uh, what are the ways in which these migratory flows will change their economic, political, and uh, normative uh, conceptualizations? So the the overarching theoretical framework that we're going to uh, present in this research is that. Uh, is, is in a way a basic framework. We're gonna argue that it's gonna be very important to look at migration as a series of stages, as a series of steps that migrants uh, take, take before they reach the destination region and change 
uh, all of these attitudes and behaviors. We're going to break it down into several uh, steps. The first is you need to think about individuals having an interest in the first place in migrating. Once they have an interest in migrating abroad for jobs, they need to have access to employment opportunities abroad before they're able to uh, meaningfully act on these interests. Once they have access to jobs, it's only then that they begin to um, psychologically and in terms of, of their lives, uh, uh, begin to plan for this process of migration. And we think that this process of planning for migration is gonna be an important uh, uh, phenomena that's gonna impact the ways in which migrants or individuals think about the state, think about their social standing, their economic position in society. And then finally, there's this process of migrating abroad and beginning to integrate in the, in the destination region. Now, a lot of the research that's looked at the uh, economic, political, and social impacts of migration tends to look look at the, the final stage. How are migrants different from non-migrants? What changed for migrants vis-a-vis uh, -vis before and after uh, this process of migrating? By breaking down uh, this theoretical uh, uh, process of migration into these various stages, we're going to argue that um, it's quite difficult to pass out the impact of employment-based migration on these outcomes, because at every one of these stages, individuals, you, you have a lot of selection problems. So individuals who have an interest in migrating are quite different from those that do not. Individuals who are able to access the jobs domestically to be able to get the networks and get the wherewithal to, to get jobs abroad are very different from those that don't. Even those that do get access to jobs uh, and then take the, the actual steps to begin to plan to migrate will be very different from those that don't. And then finally, those that end up moving and migrating and living abroad will be very different from those that don't. So uh, in a way, methodologically, this process of migration and studying the process of migration and its impact and outcomes is quite challenging because of these uh, systematic selection concerns in who gets to migrate at each of these different stages. So comparing outcomes across migrants and non-migrants in both home and host country regions will not necessarily shed light on the impact of international employment. And again, the before after comparisons, comparisons of migrants, people who uh, before they left to go abroad and then after they reach abroad might not be sufficient in understanding what causes shifts in their attitudes and behaviors because uh, these shifts could be driven by any of these four stages and steps that I uh, mentioned in this slide. Okay, so with all of that uh, uh, set up, I'm now going to give you a summary for the rest of the, the, of the, the presentation and talk. So in this study, we present a randomized controlled trial that it seeks out to evaluate the impact of international labor migration opportunities on these political and economic preferences and outcomes, uh, both of migrants as well as home communities. Our sending site is the state of Mizoram in Northeast India. It's, uh, as I will show very, uh, very soon, it's a state that lacks uh, systematic local employment opportunities for individuals. The destination site for our study is the Persian Gulf countries, in particular, uh, the United Arab Emirates, uh, as well as a few other Gulf Cooperation Council of countries. We're going to be focusing on a very particular kind of migration, migration into the hospitality uh, sector. Uh, the intervention, the randomized intervention at the heart of this study is a two-step process included on stage one, an intensive five-week skills training program to prepare candidates for hospitality sector jobs in the Persian Gulf. And the second stage of the program, uh, which was uh, which um, is followed very soon after the first stage, was a recruitment program in which we matched uh, 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 candidates uh, that were selected for the treatment uh, with a, a recruitment agency that placed them with employers seeking to hire uh, candidates from Mizoram for jobs in the hospitality sector. So in this study, we have empirical measurements of these outcomes of interest that I've been talking about uh, at baseline before the beginning of uh, the intervention. We then have uh, an evaluation after the skills training program, but so post-training, but before candidates actually began migrating abroad. And then finally, we have an evaluation after candidates migrate ab abroad. So this uh, longitudinal structure of our study allows us to parse out uh, the impacts of each of these different stages of migration potentially and study the causal impact we claim of international job opportunities on these socio-political and economic outcomes. 
So I'm just going to uh, now give you an outline for the rest of my presentation. Uh, I'm going to motivate the talk a little bit uh, by talking a bit more about uh, the context. I'll then walk you to the setting and experimental design of the study. Uh, I'll then give you the results from the first uh, analysis, which was uh, the midline study following the, the completion of the job training program, but pre-migration. We're going to call that the impact of job uh, and migration opportunities on outcomes. Then I'll give you a pre-analysis plan of the impact of uh, migration itself, so the end-line analysis after uh, uh, individuals in our program migrated abroad. Uh, I don't have outcomes for the second study, but I'll be uh, in a results-blind fashion presenting the proposed analysis, and I'll conclude by discussing implications. Okay, so uh, in terms of the motivation, as I mentioned earlier, there's been uh, uh, you know, anecdotally, we know that there's been uh, increases in trends towards South-South migration, but this anecdotal, the, the sort of slides and, and uh, examples I mentioned earlier is really borne out in the data. If you, this uh, graph from uh, the UN Migration Report looks at different region, destination regions of the world and looking at changes in the uh, number of international migrants for each of the last three decades. What I'll point out in the very right-hand uh, panel is that Northern North America, for instance, has actually seen a decrease in migrants of international migrants entering North America in this time period. We've seen an increase in Europe, which is the second to last uh, panel on the right. Um, but we, what, what's one of the sort of startling pieces of information from this graph is we see a, a phenomenal increase in, in migration in many uh, global South regions. So Sub-Saharan Africa has had a major uptick in, in migration. Uh, Northern Africa and Western Asia, which really is being driven by the Middle East and the, the Persian Gulf countries, has seen a dramatic change in the number of migrants over the same period. We've seen similar trends in Latin America as well. So the point being that Global South countries are now beginning to uh, become primary destinations for migrants uh, in the global economy. And this is true when you look at the, the sort of major countries uh, in terms of destinations. So in the year 2000, the, the, the main destinations used to be Western democracies, uh, United States, Germany, United Kingdom, Australia. But by even in the last in the, in 15 years after that, we've seen this uptick where countries such as the, uh, the Saudi Arabia and the UAE have now become pretty big destination regions for international migrants. So the India-UAE migration corridor, uh, I, when I first learned this, I was surprised uh, by how startling this, this fact is, is indeed the second largest migration corridor in the world, today second only to Mexico to the United States. Um, as of 2017, according to the United Nations, there are more migrants today moving from developing countries to other developing countries than to advanced industrialized economies. So uh, given that there's been so much work, look, uh, so much uh, 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 so a shift in the, in the composition of migrants, it is surprising that there hasn't been scholarly research uh, trying to understand both the causes and consequences of this kind of South-South migration. So the study that I'm presenting today with my co-authors is part of a larger, um, in a way, uh, sort of meta-analysis that's being conducted uh, by the, the organization Research on Empirical Aspects of Labor Migration. For those of you familiar with EGAP in political science, it has a similar structure uh, where Realm uh, has uh, uh, sponsored a large number of studies, in this case, looking at migration from various parts of Africa and Asia to the, to the Gulf Cooperation Council countries. And so as this map over here shows, uh, these various studies look at uh, sending regions across uh, from, from, you know, run the range of the major sending countries in the global south today. Uh, and, you know, a lot of them are in South Asia, but they also come from countries such as uh, Sudan in Africa, from the Philippines. Our study was one of these many studies trying to, uh, from a scientific perspective, understand and uh, collect uh, em new empirical evidence on these new forms of migratory flows to the Persian Gulf and uh, with an aim towards coming up with an ethical blueprint of regulating and understanding these movements going forward uh, for, for governments and policy makers. Okay, so let me now move into uh, directly into the study setting and the experimental design. Okay, so uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, the destination region that we were looking at uh, is the state of Mizoram in Northeast India. It's the red uh, uh, state on the map on the very left-hand panel of the slide. Um, as you can see, it's quite remote. 
uh, geographically, it's on the border of Myanmar and, um, and Bangladesh. Uh, in terms of the, the larger ethos of the Indian subcontinent, um, um, both ethnically and geographically, Mizoram is one of the frontier states. It's, it, it isn't considered part of mainland India. Uh, it's a uh, part of a small cluster of northeastern states that uh, uh, remain quite marginalized from the, the, ma the major uh, domestic economy uh, in the country. So uh, as we see, uh, Mizoram and its surrounding states uh, tend to have very small populations and because of their isolated uh, geography, they're very hilly, very mountainous, uh, they tend to have geographic barriers to mobility. The population of Mizoram is small, it's only around 1 million uh, people in a country of more than, uh, you know, 1.4 billion people. Uh, the GDP per capita is small as well, it's uh, 1600 US dollars very high unemployment rates. Most people at work are either working in agriculture or working for the government, which is the largest employer. All that said, it's also an interesting uh, setting because literacy rates are extremely high. We have 92, we see a 92% literacy rate and it's almost equal for men and women, unlike many other parts of India where you see a big gap between male and female literacy rates. So what are the languages? The, la the major language of India is Miso, which is the the language of the of the Mizo uh, tribe that really uh, dominates this state. So as you see, they, people don't speak Hindi. Hindi is not spoken in this region, but English is widely spoken uh, in Mizoram and in surrounding states. Now, Mizo, as I mentioned, are scheduled uh, a tribal a, a tribal community. The government of India deems them a scheduled tribe, uh, which is a designation given to historically marginalized communities. Now, uh, as a result of their tribal status, uh, there's been uh, a fair amount of research showing that Mizos face discrimination in finding job opportunities in the, the mainland. So there's a lot of documented animosity against uh, uh, for, uh, citizens of India from the Northeastern states when they move to the major uh, in migration, internal migration uh, destinations like Mumbai, New Delhi, uh, Bangalore, et cetera. So we argue, as I mentioned earlier, we argue that this sort of uh, marginalized minority status in the domestic economy uh, can actually be a boon for minorities looking to uh, find employment opportunities in places uh, where they don't face uh, these forms of systemic discrimination. And these tend to be abroad, like in uh, other out, uh, out region, outstanding uh, regions of the country like Kerala. Uh, and uh, surrounding countries like Bangladesh, Nepal are also, I, I just have you know, are major out uh, sending regions of South Asia to uh, countries in the Persian Gulf. Okay, so the, the, as I mentioned earlier, the, 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 the flow that we're looking at, the corridor, is the Mizoram, UAE, and Gulf Migration Corridor. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there's little interest in Mizoram for migrating to other parts of India, yet there's a substantial demand for labor-based migration opportunities. Because of the high rates of unemployment, the lack of local job opportunities, people are looking to get job opportunities abroad, and both the government and various uh, civil society organizations have been trying to promote uh, labor-based migration. Okay, uh, we also find that Mizos tend to be restricted uh, because of their geographic and skills related barriers from conventional jobs in the mainland. So following ex the examples of countries like Bangladesh, Nepal, states such as Kerala, the state government of Mizoram, the Mizoram Youth Commission and local NGOs uh, uh, have been promoting uh, actively migration from Mizoram to the Gulf. Um, but this has uh, been a very new process and the government sought the assistance of scholars uh, to design and scientifically evaluate a program, a job training and a recruitment program for MISO young adults looking for job opportunities abroad. And that's where we came in, the three of us as scholars in this study. Uh, so the destination regions are gonna be UAE and Gulf cooperation countries. You may ask, you know, why not send people to the United States or the United Kingdom? The answer is obvious because of the, uh, um, the, the really restrictive policy regimes in Western democracies. It's very hard for uh, individuals who just want to get job opportunities abroad to get jobs in Western democracies. And so, um, I, you know, I, I, I think if you were to ask people with, where would they like to go, um, it's not that there's a, there's a preference per se for jobs in the Gulf as opposed to other countries. It's just that these are um, uh, logistically and policy-wise the most feasible places for people looking for jobs abroad to be able to migrate. 
So the UAE's population, I'll also mention, is extremely international. 85% of the UAE's population is foreign born. They're three times as many Indians as Emirati citizens in, in the UAE. Uh, now, the GCC in a, as a whole, this is the Gulf Cooperation, Cooperation Council, has a growing demand for foreign English speaking workers to, to sort of fuel its, uh, its big economic boom that it's witnessed over the past two decades. There's a great deal uh, of demand for workers in the food service, hospitality, and hoteling sectors. So let me walk you now to the structure and timeline of the study. So early 2018, and I wanna walk you through this still to give you a sense of the logistically complicated nature of this study and the number of different partners we collaborated with uh, in order to get this uh, study off the ground. So early 2018, we collaborated with the government of Mizoram and the Mizoram Youth Commission to advertise job opportunities through local uh, newspapers, television, social media venues, job fairs, for people looking for job opportunities abroad. Then in June 2018, we began, uh, we selected a bunch of individuals, a number of individuals who responded to these, uh, 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 these advertisements and were interested in moving abroad and that had basic competencies. So had English language ability, uh, were high school passes and had their uh, appropriate, uh, were in the appropriate age limit. Okay, so then what happened? In late 2018, we collaborated with a New Delhi based survey firm. This was our partner that did the main uh, uh, evaluate this, uh, the main measurements in this, in this analysis. So, hiring, uh, working with local enumerators belonging to both genders, we uh, conducted interviews. This is the baseline interviews of all uh, individuals who registered into the study, entered the registration process. Uh, we conducted these interviews in Ezol, which is the capital of Mizoram, following which a randomly selected half of the study participants were selected for the skills training and recruitment program. Then late 2018, th this is when the training program began. Here we worked with a Bangalore-based uh, training firm that specialized in the hospitality sector, uh, training for employment in jobs abroad, uh, spe specifically in the, in, in the Persian Gulf. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit more about the, the, pro the program. It was a five-week program, and the goal was to prepare to give candidates the basic skills required to be able to interview with employers, to be able to show some kind of basic competency in these jobs. Now, of course, this isn't. A, I would just highlight that these aren't in-depth training programs. All employers, but once they hire candidates, put uh, candidates to their own in-house training programs. The goal over here was to just give candidates a basic amount of competency to be eligible for uh, job interviews with these firms. Then following the end of the, of the training program, we went back with our survey firm and did a midline survey analysis early 2019. Uh, it was around two, uh, 30 minutes, it was conducted by, via telephone and we offered incentives to, our, uh, to all subjects to participate in the, in the program. We then worked with the second stage of the intervention, which is a Mumbai-based recruitment firm that specializes in recruitment of, uh, of workers in the hospitality sector from South Asia to the Persian Gulf. It was a, a vetted a recruitment firm that, we, uh, uh, that was recommended to us by uh, New York University Abu Dhabi, uh, and, uh, and this firm worked in, uh, to help um, connect candidates with employers looking to hire candidates. And then uh, starting late last year, December 2020, we began our end line analysis. This is after people uh, began to migrate uh, uh, during this process, if they did. Okay, so who are our subjects? Now our subjects are, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, the sample frame is everyone who uh, entered the registration process. Okay, so anyone who indicated willingness or interest to take up employment. If you recall the first stage in the theory slide, the first stage of migration was an interest in taking up migration. And we are selecting on people who are interested in taking up migration and have basic uh, competencies. So what's the characteristics? It's a, it's a fairly young cohort as uh, is tends to be the case with international migrants, uh, especially labor migrants. The median age is 23 years, 95% are Mesos, 98% are Christian, and that's because scheduled tribes tend to, there was a big missionary presence during the colonial period in this area. Uh, they're quite religious, 90% pray daily. Uh, most of them, the vast majority are born in Mizoram. Most of them have never been married, 94%. Uh, of highly educated, uh, almost all have finished grade 10, significant proportion have completed a bachelor's degrees. 
Okay. They uh, have very few contacts abroad. Only 10% have families outside of India, 16% of families outside of Mizoram in, in the rest of India. Only 3% know of friends outside of India, 11% uh, of friends outside of Mizoram. The countries that they've heard about are places like USA, Singapore, Australia, but also Qatar, Bahrain, UAE, Malaysia, et cetera. Okay, to show you that our, uh, uh, our randomization was done, was successful, uh, we have an equally balanced sample in the treatment and control, uh, almost equal numbers across both groups, uh, and they are balanced on uh, all key demographic uh, characteristics. Okay, so now let me walk you through the, the experimental intervention. And the first part of the intervention was the skills training program. Uh, this had two components. It was a classroom component in which candidates were given uh, information and instruction and in things such as food safety, communication, etiquette, cultural sensitivity, things such as food and, um, and kitchen and food preparation, uh, how to handle a barista bar, uh, how, you know, some instructions about housekeeping, uh, grooming, hygiene, interview preparation, following which they were then put into a two-week internship in a local restaurant, hotels and restaurants in Ezol, the capital of Mizoram. So as you can see in the photos, we have candidates working in various uh, uh, food, uh, food jobs, various uh, sort of customer service, uh, sales-related uh, jobs, as well as going through this training program. The faces have been anonymized. Now, the second part of this program was the recruitment component, okay? So once they finished the training and, and uh, uh, the training and internship experience, uh, and this is after the, the midline analysis, survey analysis, we then got our Mumbai-based uh, recruitment firm, Vera International, that helped candidates really prepare their resumes. They helped, uh, uh, helped them prepare for interviews. Uh, then they matched them with a number of their employ employment contact, employer-based contacts in the UAE, uh, and the Gulf. So these range from, um, you know, food services, uh, uh, outfits such as Costa Coffee or Chili's to, to restaurants such as uh, Papa John's to uh, airways such as Emirates Airways, hotels such as Mandarin Oriental. Uh, and they sort of also help uh, migrants put together the, you know, navigate the pretty complex uh, uh, immigration process, obtaining passports or obtaining visas, getting the medical certification, etc. Okay. So I just now want to uh, uh, show how, uh, you know, some of the results after the midline survey. So this was the survey that was conducted right after the, uh, the, the training program. We had some attrition we, across treatment and control. We had around 70 to 75% of uh, people uh, ended up taking the midline survey and the rest did not take the survey. Uh, but we find that uh, this, this attrition is not significantly affected by treatment status. It has, uh, it has no effect on the balance of the treatment groups, and it is, is not predicted by any pretreatment covariates as well as or by program attendance. So we are, we're not too concerned about attrition, uh, and we also find that um, the treatment worked as exactly as we intended. So in the treatment group, around 68% of respondents said that they'd attended a training uh, program, uh, as, as, uh, you know, in the control, we didn't stop people in the control group from trying to uh, uh, um, get training or move abroad if they wanted to. And indeed, around 37% of them took some kind of local training program or tried to get access to local training programs. As we'll show later, the real innovation of the study is this sort of job placement, the second stage where we give access to employers abroad. And that's where we think uh, 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 the, the treatment really has its bite because that's where uh, people, uh, candidates and individuals in Mizoram who don't have access to job opportunities abroad begin to get access to these kinds of opportunities. Okay, so what is our empirical strategy? We, we're using an intention to treat framework. So we're substituting the endogenous treatment, which is the training and recruitment program with the exogenous assignment to treatment. So the, we're looking at invita the invitation to attend the program at registration uh, as, the, um, as the assignment to treatment. Uh, all of our outcomes tend to be standardized indices. We have multiple survey questions measuring each outcome. Where we have multiple outcomes, we had z-score, uh, z-scores of each response, which are then normalized. We also control for baseline measures of all pre, uh, major pre-treatment outcomes. Uh, and in robustness uh, tests, we include demographic covariates as well. The results are, uh, do not, are not affected at all. Uh, we, use a, uh, we calculate p-values using randomized inference, but these results, again, are robust to simple OLS standard errors. 
Uh, so we pre-registered all of these analyses for our midline surveys on the EGAP online registry. Uh, we had strong predictions about the directions of our theories, and so we had one-sided hypothesis tests. Uh, and places where we don't, I, I will notify you. I also want to take a moment to just uh, flag some um, uh, the, the, the serious thought that we gave to ethical considerations in this study. Now, of course, uh, you know, uh, in, in this room, we should all be aware, uh, we, and we all know that uh, as scholars of migration, that migration poses uh, risks to all, of all kinds to individuals. Um, some of them, uh, and not all, uh, but some of them might include struggling to incorporate, integrate to the destination regions. We know, of course, that in, uh, in especially in many uh, global south destination regions, there have been cases of exploitation. And in fact, Realm, uh, the organization that, I, uh, that funded the, the meta-analysis of these studies uh, uh, that I mentioned earlier, one of its main goals is to try and come up with empirical and theoretical uh, studies that can help uh, shed light on the practices that can prevent uh, this kind of exploitation going forward. So our goal, of course, over here was to try and minimize risks to subjects, but also ensure that the bene any benefits that, that occurred would flow back to migrants in their communities. Uh, I'd like to just flag that this program was requested by the government of Mizoram, as well as the Mizoram Youth Commission, which is the arm of the government, as well as the leading uh, Mizo community organizations. Uh, the idea was to build on prior government attempts. The government had previously attempted to promote employment to the GCC, and it wasn't sure about the, uh, the efficacy of the programs it had uh, instituted. In fact, not many had uh, succeeded. It wanted to come up with, uh, uh, with it wanted to uh, get, gain access to scientific evidence that would help it evaluate uh, a blueprint for uh, ethical and safe labor migration practices going forward. And the major goal was to try and also create a template for other kinds of skill development opportunities in this region and in other ascending regions in the Global South. We worked pretty closely with all of these partners, including NYU Abu Dhabi's um, various offices. Uh, we we uh, you know, selected partners that uh, were vetted by, uh, by various organizations. Uh, for instance, our focus on the hospitality sector was because the hospitality sector tends to be very highly regulated. The pay, uh, pay is extremely lucrative. It's reputable. The contracts are, uh, you know, uh, are, are uh, given to both the host country government and the home country government. Uh, so all migrants were in our study were registered with both the Indian authorities, UAE authorities. They had official employment contracts contracts and employers paid for all costs, uh, and, uh, such as visas, travel, et cetera. Uh, and they were, subjects were also uh, provided extensive training and information on their rights and recourses. I would just um, make one last point of the year and say that, you know, regardless, the fact of the matter is that we're seeing these millions and millions of people moving across national boundaries uh, uh, today in the global south. Uh, and uh, one of our sort of goals, uh, one of the ethical goals we had at the back of our minds was to, to uh, not turn a blind eye to these migration flows, but to try and come up with, um, with scientific evidence that could help um, regulate these flows in, in better ways going forward. Okay, so let me now jump straight into the results of our analyses. So the first set of analyses that I mentioned will be the results of our um, midline study. So we're looking at the impact of the migration opportunity. This is after people complete this training and uh, internship program, they know that they're going to get access to uh, interviews with employers abroad, but they haven't as yet migrated. So we're looking to see to what extent does this prospective anticipation of migration change uh, the, the behaviors and, and preferences of individuals and uh, in, in order to be able to disentangle that from the process of migration. So I'm going to walk you through a few of our mechanisms and outcomes. So our first, uh, we had a few mechanisms. We, we first, as I mentioned earlier, we wanted to, uh, we, we pre-registered the hypothesis uh, that international employment uh, opportunities would le lead members, especially of these uh, marginalized ethnic groups, to believe that job uh, opportunities abroad would be more lucrative and would come with less discrimination than opportunities domestically. So this was give, this sort of series of questions were, were given to um, uh, subjects in both the treatment and control groups. And here are some results. So and asked, in which places do you believe that jobs would offer a better income? Your skills would be valued more. You'd be more likely to be promoted, treated well, uh, less likely to face discrimination. There's a stark gap. Individuals really do believe that 
uh, specifically in the Gulf region, they're going to have more opportunities to do better economically, to get promoted and move up their, the economic ladder than they are uh, in mainland India. Um, and so, you know, to sort of corroborate some of our ideas about why people are so interested in beginning to migrate abroad in the first place. Okay, so we, we then wanted to uh, test the, the mechanism that compared to the control group, people, subjects in the treatment group would have made greater economic investment. So we wanted to make sure that they are, wanted to test whether they were actually taking steps to begin this process of moving abroad. So our hypothesis was that they were more likely to begin to plan to move, move abroad and take concrete steps to do so. And we find very strong evidence of this. So when asked about things such, so th this is an index, the first line in all of these tables will be the, the, um, the result of the, the aggregate index, which is what I would draw your attention to. I've also presented the constituent terms. I'm happy to talk about that more the, each term in the Q&A, but I would really draw your attention to the first row in each of these tables, which has the aggregate result. So we find that people uh, in the, uh, who uh, take part in the treatment are ex or assigned to treatment are extremely uh, more likely to uh, be taking steps to move abroad. They're applying for passports, they're looking into labor laws in the Gulf, they're researching companies, they think that, that they're likely to move abroad in the near future. Okay, so all of this again, we're trying to use this to try and understand, you know, what is, what's actually, how is this process of prospective uh, migration changing their, their individuals' uh, uh, behaviors? We think it's because people are now beginning to envision a new life abroad, an economically lucrative, um, more enhanced life abroad. So the first hypothesis, our main primary hypothesis, was that these job opportunities abroad would expand migrants' economic prospects. And we think that migrants would anticipate larger, more stable economic futures. We find strong evidence of this. We find that in, in, measure, in an index of measures of economic confidence, migrants are much more likely to think that they will do better. So these are people who were assigned to the treatment group as opposed to the control. They think that they will advance professionally, they'll do better in their next job, their long-term financial prospects will be better. Um, and overall, this is a very strong, uh, uh, strong uh, and statistically significant result. Our next uh, uh, hypothesis, we have three main hypotheses. The second one over here was that as individuals start to envision a better economic life for themselves, we think that they, we predicted that individuals would become more politically empowered uh, and would begin engaging more politically with the state. And this of course flows from a large literature in American politics, which documents how income, wealth, resources are a significant predictor of political participation. It, when you have more income, more economic well, uh, material uh, stakes in the political process, you're more likely to go the extra mile to begin engaging with the state. So we, we argue that this prospective process will lead migrants to participate more in the electoral process. And, um, and this is indeed what we found. We found that uh, looking at uh, uh, the, our aggregate index of partic political participation, we see significant positive movement for the treatment group. Uh, and you know, looking at the constituent terms, we actually find that people in the, control, in the treatment group were more likely to have voted in the state elections that took place around the same time, right after the training program, but before migration and for the, the midline survey. They thought that they would be more likely to vote in the future. They were more likely to debate politics, attend rallies. And overall, we, fee we find this uh, significant positive movement in uh, measures of political engagement. A third, uh, sort of tying the economic and politics uh, together, we predicted that as individuals tend to have a more enhanced economic future, envision a more enhanced economic future, and as they begin to become more politically active in order to engage with the state and have a stake in politics, this uh, uh, economic well-being and material enhancement will make individuals more likely to become fiscally conservative again, following the literature and political economy that shows that wealth tends to, uh, wealth and income increases tends to make people more economically uh, um, conservative, more opposed to redistribution. So we look to see whether migrants will become less supportive of, of state-led redistribution. We find over here that uh, on these, uh, the, the aggregate index, we see movement again, uh, individuals think uh, are, uh, um, are much more opposed in the treatment group, are much more opposed to uh, redistribution, the state taking a large role in taxing and redistributing uh, resources within the economy. So uh, these are the three sets of uh, sort of political economy findings that we uh, that we 
uh, pre-registered. I'll just uh, briefly mention, I can come back to this in the Q&A, we had also looked at a few other outcomes related to gender empowerment and the empowerment of young adults. Uh, we don't find in, in this midline uh, analysis, we do not find any movement on uh, norms of gender equality. Uh, and we think that part of it is that, the, um, you know, you, you need to, if you, in order to find these social movements, uh, you, there needs to be the, this actual process of migrating abroad before and, and interacting with different cultures before uh, um, you, you register movements on social norms and preferences. Okay, so just to give a quick recap, what we find over here is that members from this midline analysis, just these prospective international job opportunities seem to have a pretty strong effect. Members of traditionally excluded groups uh, anticipate substantial gains from employment abroad. They report uh, expecting better pay, less discrimination, more career advancement. Uh, they take steps, active steps, apply for passports, research jobs, begin to envision uh, uh, their lives abroad uh, as a result of this process. They begin to anticipate substantial economic gains, both for themselves and their families in the future, as a result of which they seem to become more polit politically engaged and active and become more fiscally conservative, more opposed to taxation and redistribution. We think this evidence is consistent with the, uh, consistent with the literature and economic economics that looks at uh, the pro uh, was, it's termed as the prospect for uh, upward mobility the, um, and uh, this idea that when people begin to envision themselves doing better economically over time, it changes the ways in which they, they think about the state, the, thing, the way in which they engage with the policy levers of the state. Okay. So, uh, and I would just reiterate over here that this midline survey does allow us to uh, isolate this impact of uh, this migration process, but we're looking, we're isolating the impact of just the anticipation of migration from the actual movement of migration. So again, a lot of the scholarly literature that has looked at migration, looked at these uh, ways in which migration tends to have these big impacts on individuals, we think um, not a lot of it has disentangled where these impacts are drawn from. We're showing that at least at this first stage, planning for migration, there seems to be a fair amount of uh, causal impact uh, of these opportunities on the ways in which people think about their experiences with the state. Okay, so I now want to spend the rest of the talk to uh, discuss the analysis plan for our endline survey. This is this survey is looking is designed to analyze the impact of migration itself and isolate that from the the previous anticipation of migration that we just discussed. So uh, over here, I don't have results for you because this is this is data, the, the study is ongoing. So I don't have uh, analyses for you, but I, I'm gonna uh, present our results prime pre-analysis plan. Um, and uh, we're at a stage where we would very much welcome your comments and feedback on the analysis as we'll be able to, uh, uh, we have, we, we'll be able to, uh, we're still thinking about this analysis plan and we'll be able to incorporate your feedback if you have any. So we think that the, uh, once people have the ability to migrate, they have access to jobs and they begin to move, uh, uh, a, a series of things are gonna take place. The first is individuals in the treatment group will become more likely to migrate overseas than those in the control group, because now uh, it's not just that they have the interest, they now have the ability to take advantage of these interests. Um, I want to present some data from the baseline survey uh, a, a baseline sample was quite poor. Uh, only 4% of our sample was employed. The median wage was uh, around 120 US dollars per month. Um, family income is uh, 285 US dollars a month. This is a pretty poor, uh, inconsistent with, this, with, the, with the study setting, Mizoram. Uh, this is not a very, very wealthy sample. Only 20% of households own a car. Uh, and 91%, but 91% of them think that they will be able to advance professionally in the future. So our, I presented that because I want to uh, walk you through some of our hypotheses. We think that migration will have a significant positive impact on individuals' as economic status. Uh, we think that uh, treatment group individuals would be better off economically than those in the control group, uh, both in objective terms, but also in terms of perceptions. We think that they would be more likely to have perceptions of positive perceptions of their current and future economic status. Uh, they might also change uh, their economic behaviors uh, such as delaying marriage or child during this work in behavioral economics that shows this uh, to be a case and people have a more enhanced economic prospects. Uh, and consistent with the earlier evidence, we think uh, uh, enhanced economic prospects will dampen support for redistribution, redistributive policies. 
So uh, the next, uh, you know, I, I sort of framed the project by talking about the differences between South, uh, North and South South migration. Given that our migrants in the sample are moving from India democracy to the Persian Gulf, which are non-democratic countries, but highly effective, highly, uh, um, you know, wealthy, effective states, we are very interested in studying the difference and in, in, in studying the trade-offs uh, in, uh, in how people evaluate democracy versus effective states and effective governance. So from the baseline survey, here's some data. Uh, we asked uh, individuals to what extent do their preferences for democracy versus effective government governance. And what we found, I'll just point to the, the last row, 35% said they prefer democracy versus 65% said that they would prefer economic development. Now, when you look at sort of the first row, citizens have an influence of a government, 67% say they prefer democracy, 32% say that they would prefer the government, the government that would get more things done effectively. So we want to now look to see, does migration change any of these processes as people move to these highly effective Persian Gulf states, but that are non-democratic in, in, in the institutional character? We had the following three hypotheses. The first is that individuals in the treatment group will begin to have lower confidence in Indian political institutions than those in the control group. And we think that's because as uh, migrants move to these highly effective states, they might become um, uh, more willing to privilege a state that's able to deliver effective um, uh, policies, effective uh, uh, um, sort of uh, societies. And, that's, and, and, and are willing to trade off uh, democratic represent representation in a way that's different from the literature uh, in South to North migration. We also think that this exposure of being, and, and it is, is gonna be driven by this exposure of people in the treatment group to uh, institutions in, and government institutions in the host countries. These institutions will be, demo, will be less democratic, but more effective than uh, the institutions in back home. And we think that this uh, uh, next hypothesis that individuals will be more willing to trade democracy for effective governments uh, uh, than those in the control group. We also, uh, our, our prediction is mixed. So we have two, a two-sided test when it comes to political participation. We're not quite sure which way this is gonna go. On the one hand, we think that the, the process of migrating uh, will give individuals resources and make them, give them a bigger stake in the political process back home. At the same time, um, as they become uh, begin to see these non-democratic countries that have effective institutions, maybe they'll become less engaged with uh, the democratic process back home. So we have a, uh, uh, we, we think that uh, political participation can go in two ways. Finally, we look at uh, a set of outcomes related to identities and tolerance and trust. So in the baseline uh, uh, surveys, we, we asked individuals, to what extent do they identify as Indians, Mesos, individuals as citizens? Only 27% of them thought of themselves as an Indian. 34% said that they were citizens of the world. 13% said they were Mesos. The vast majority of them wanted to stop migration from mainland India into Mizoram. So they're quite, uh, in a way, uh, uh, parochial in the sense of economic policy. They're restrictionist in terms of migration from mainland India into Mizoram. Similarly, they want to restrict migration from Bangladesh into uh, Mizoram in India. Uh, and in terms of trust in institutions, they have, the most amount of trust they have is in community institutions. So our final set of hypotheses have to do with uh, do individuals in the treatment group, as they begin to go to these foreign countries, interact with members of other races, religions, and nationalities, do they become to identify more as citizens of the world than those in the control group? Do they become more uh, supportive of, of international cooperation, more interested in international politics? And do they then, as they begin to interact with other Indians and let, and, you know, in this foreign country than with their own uh, brethren in their, in, in, their, in their home regions, will they become more tolerant of mainland Indians? Will they become more nationalistic in their, in their perspectives, uh, more supportive of, of migration, more interested in national political events? Okay, so I'm going to uh, now just skip forward to the conclusion. I, I was just going to mention over here that we have a, a, a parallel set of analyses at the end line of household members. We're also interested to see 
and, and test whether this process of migration has spillover effects in, on members of the households in, uh, uh, for people who begin to migrate. And we have very similar um, uh, hypotheses. We look to see whether members of the households become more economically uh, well off as they gain remittances, do they begin to engage with the state in a different way, do they, do they become do they, uh, notions of identity and nationalism change through this migration process of members of their households. So uh, to, I, I can come back to that in the q and I just want to take a moment to, to, to just reiterate that uh, you know, these findings in the end line, uh, uh, we, we, I, I look forward to sharing the results with you down the line when we have our data. I, uh, we really do welcome comments on the design and these hypotheses. And if you have other suggestions, we'd very much uh, uh, like your suggestions and we'd like to incorporate them into our analysis plan. Uh, I, went, I want to take the last slide, last two slides, we're just talking about some implications. I'm running out of time, but I'm just going to take a moment to, to, to talk a little bit about what the implications of this study might uh, have for governments and NGOs that are trying to strengthen migrant protections in the case of South-South migration. What we see is that South-South migration, although it's reshaping labor movement flows in the global economy, it's unregulated, it's unsupervised, it's private, and it's understudied by scholars. We, uh, some, of our, some of the insights we're coming up with, especially through our collaborations with these state governments, is that governments in both home and host countries should begin to regulate these movements. They should be vetting employers, recruitment firms, supervising contracts, assisting, assisting migrants at each stage of the process. And scholars too, and there's a group of new scholars, Yang Yang is one of them, uh, there are others who are looking at migratory flows across developing countries. We think that there's a, a lot of uh, fertile ground for scholars and the social scienti uh, scientists to begin uh, uh, shedding uh, theoretical and empirical perspectives on mobility and globalization uh, uh, with respect to uh, migration in the global south. And to conclude, I just want to mention um, a, uh, a few scope conditions. We look at the hospitality sector over here. We think our research does raise some productive questions related to other types of migratory flows. So low-skill migration, we think construction, domestic health, for instance, might have very different uh, results as, as, as would high-skill migration, doctors, nurses, and financiers. Other kinds of migratory corridors, intra-Africa, intra-Asia, do the differences in these host country institutions and cultures matter? We think these are productive uh, areas of future research. And finally, I think uh, it's important to stress that South-South migration should not be studied in isolation. It's part of a broader process of global migratory flows. People move to, from developing countries to other developing countries when access to uh, uh, immigration in developed countries is restricted. So what do we, uh, how do we begin to understand South-South flows as we see a rise in populism and nativism in the West, as we see shifts in uh, policy regimes in countries such as the United States that move from family-based to employment-based uh, migration. We think that this is going to have systematic effects on South-South migratory flows and have an impact on uh, migrants' both decisions to migrate and outcomes. So with that, I'd like to thank you all for your, um, uh, your time and attention. I very much look forward to your uh, questions and comments. Our email addresses of my, myself and my co-authors are on the screen. Uh, and here are some photos from uh, field research. Uh, thank you so much, Yang Yang. I'm, I'm going to hand the floor back to you.